Good morning and welcome to the first guest lecture in the course of Comparative Constitutional Law. I am delighted to introduce you to uh, Professor Jonathan uh, Fesha. Uh, Jonathan uh, is um, an associate professor at the Western Cape University in Cape Town, so in South Africa. He got his law degree in Addis Ababa, then he completed an, an LLM and a PhD in South Africa, where he currently works, or where he used to work until, uh, when was it, uh, June? Because since June, he is a researcher here in Bolzano, at the European Academy, in the Institute uh, on Comparative Federalism. So, Professor Fessa is an expert in federalism, in constitutional design, in divided society, and uh, because of his um, expertise in these topics, I thought it was uh, uh, an opportunity and a privilege for us to host him in this course in order to broaden our focus. The focal point in our discussion so far has been largely Eurocentric or related to the Western legal tradition. We mentioned occasionally South Africa and other countries uh, outside the Western legal tradition, but most of the time uh, our course was biased in that direction. It's important to know that there is a, an interesting world also outside the Western legal tradition. There is a world in which interesting stuff are happening and uh, some of them will be uh, presented today in this uh, lecture on federalism and ethnic diversity in Africa. Now, we have some very general knowledge about federalism. We know what federalism means and what are, in particular, its purposes. We mentioned that one of the purposes is to enhance democratic self-government, to accommodate diversities. I suspect that this is uh, the part of the general knowledge that will be deepened in the uh, lecture today. Without much further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Fessa. He told me he would like to have an interactive uh, class, so feel free to ask questions uh, if you need clarification, if you want to uh, comment on uh, his uh, uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today uh, uh, to speak uh, about uh, the challenges of ethnic diversity in, in African states and, and how federalism uh, can be used to help deal with those challenges. Uh, so, so there are two things you can see here, federalism and ethnic diversity. So before I uh, sp uh, speak about the African context and the African issues and challenges, uh, let me just uh, say a few words about the, 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 uh, the two concepts generally. Now, so ethnic diversity, I think, as you know, is, uh, is, mo is something that characterizes most countries in the world. Uh, if you look at the states that are recognized by the United Nations, uh, almost 90 percent of them are ethnically diverse. It's also these states that are home to uh, about 95 percent of the world's population. So diversity characterizes most states. And Africa is no exception to that. Uh, Africa is, is diverse in terms of language, religion, and other fault lines. Uh, of course, some African states are more diverse than, than others. So Nigeria has about 250 ethnic groups, uh, while Rwanda has only three ethnic groups. But still, ethnic diversity is the norm rather than the exception. Now, but when we mention diversity in relation to federalism, it's not just the fact that the state is diverse ethnically speaking. Is, is, is the issue. Uh, it's, it's when the state is also what's called divided. Now there's a difference between 
an ethnically diverse society and a divided society. Now, what do you think is the difference? What, 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 what is the difference between an ethnically divided society, uh, ethnically diverse society, and a divided uh, society? Yes, please. There's no peaceful coexistence, okay. Yes. There's tensions and conflicts, okay. Anyone else? And, and, and what causes that? What causes that? So, yes, the, so, it's, we, so we, the difference is that, that in ethnically diverse, in a divided society, it's not just only that it's diverse. But also the fact that, that, that diversity is politicized. So, so the ethnic differences have also become political differences. So these are the societies in which political cooperation or political competition is conducted in ethnic terms. So there is sort of a, a parallelism between the sociological differences and the political uh, divisions. That's when we say society is not only diverse, but also divided. Because not all diverse societies are divided. But many diverse societies are also divided. And a divided society is not necessarily confined to a particular part of the world, or it's confined to a particular kind of social economic conditions. You find it in ev everywhere. So, for example, in 2010, South Africa hosted the World Cup, if you remember us, now a long time ago. Uh, now, who won that World Cup? Spain. Spain. <laughs> yes. Sp yes. Spain won, won that World Cup. But many asked, Spain won the World Cup, but whose victory was it? Why do they ask? And if you look at this picture here now. So this is the moment that they won the World Cup. They're celebrating, not with the Spanish flag, but with the Catalan flag. So, so you also find divided societies in, a, in the economically uh, well of uh, part of the world. But also divided societies are not future of authoritarian Regimes. They do not come because there is no democracy. Even in a democracy, you might have divided societies. So, for example, if you look at this picture here, this fox seems to be celebrating something, yes? They seem to be happy. What are they celebrating? Where do you think this is? I'm, you can guess from the flag. Belgium. So, what are they celebrating? Well, because Belgium made it into the Guinness Book of World Records by becoming the first country without government for 249 days. So another divided society. And for us, the question is, even in such a flourishing democracy, you have a divided society. And of course, because of the tension between the two linguistic communities. Now, but divide such communal tensions are not usually celebrated in a style, like you see here. They are not usually peaceful, as you have seen from Catalonia recently. They can also result in a protracted armed struggle. Because Sudan, South Sudan fought for its independence for decades. And the end result sometimes might be devastating for the country. Because it might result in what we call political Divorce. That is where a part of a territory of a state might even secede, leave the state and establish its own independence state, as you can see from South Sudan, which doesn't necessarily bring about the desired result of peace and stability, as you, can, as you must have heard from the events in South Sudan. So then the question is, how does a constitution can help to manage such tensions while at the same time maintaining national unity. 
and and it's particularly can federalism help to manage ethnic diversity so that's what the, what that will be the focus of our our uh, discussion and we'll try to do that within the context of african states but also referring to other uh, case studies now if a state is ethnically uh, plural, if a state is ethnically diverse, broadly speaking, there are two conditional approaches that a country might wish to follow. Broadly speaking, there, there are continuums between the two extremes, but broadly speaking, there are two approaches that a conditional approach that a country might follow. And the first approach is the first approach is for the constitution to disregard the ethnic diversity of the st that characterizes the society and try to build a common national identity, try to build a single national identity. So here, the constitution tries to build a single or a common national identity either by using a single language or culture or by using a, some ideologies that transcend these ethnic differences. So this is an attempt to create a common national identity. So most constitutions start with this, we the people. So this is an attempt to project a homogenized image of the society, to create one people. And that is one approach. The other approach is for the state, for, for, for the condition of a country, to acknowledge its ethnic diversity, to recognize that it's not constituted of one people, or that it's constituted of diverse ethnic groups, and recognize that, and make that a central pillar of the constitutional order. So for example, so as opposed to we the people, for example, until recently, uh, from Europe, for example, the Swiss have said, we the people of the cantons. The cantons are the, the units within uh, Switzerland. Or, or the Belgian constitution would say, the federation is composed of <coughs> communities and regions, as opposed to uh, in, uh, pro pro uh, projecting this image of one. Now, this Africa has the same experience. So in the 1960s, the, and the 1960s was an exciting year in Africa because it's a, that's a year of decolonization. Now, in the 60s, African leaders were confronted with a complex problem, a problem of maintaining the territorial integrity, the unity of the newly independent but divided states that they inherited from the colonial powers. Independent, newly independent, but divided. Now, so they told that, that the primary aim of the constitution should be to maintain and promote national unity. So they tell that a constitution that recognizes ethnic diversity, they thought, gives rise to divisive politics, instability, and disintegration. So they ignored or tried to suppress ethnic diversity. So what they said, well, what they thought was that their primary task is to forge national unity and maintain the territorial integrity they inherited from the colonial powers. So, so that's why if you look at most independent constitutions in Africa, they describe the state as indivisible and unitary. So, so the constitution is seen as an instrument to build a nation, to build a nation. Now, so all African constitutions try to build a nation, try to ignore or suppress their diversity, uh, and try to build a homogenized society, a one people for each state. But of course, the approach they followed is not necessarily the same. 
Yes, the aim is, is to build a nation, but the approach, the conditional approach, is not necessarily the same. And if you look at these African countries, then you see at least identify two approaches that were used by the constitutions of African states. Now, the first approach is an approach which says, which tries to build an image of, of, of a united society or of, 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 of a people, one people, by diffusing or imposing the language and culture of one group over the rest of the population. So, for example, they might use the language or culture of the dominant group or the numerically majority group and impose that on the, on the population. So the, lang so the country would say that the language of this par particular group would be the language of the state. So a very good example would be Sudan, for example. In Sudan, the condition I tried to build the identity of the Sudanese state along the language, culture, and history of the largely Arab, Muslim, Northern Sudanese, and impose that on a largely black, Christian, Southern Sudanese. So that is one attempt where the states, and the same in Ethiopia, where the state's constitution tries to build an identity of the state along the language and culture of one group and impose that on the rest of the population. Now the other conditional approach, and which is followed by most African countries, is not to impose the language of a particular group. It rather tries to Im build a conditional identity of the state that is beyond ethnicity, that is based on what we call a supra-ethnic basis, that's, that goes beyond ethnicity. That, so it, it doesn't try to impose the language and culture of a particular group, but actually tries to build a common public institutions, a common public sphere, but using the colonial language which could be French, Portuguese, or English. And this is a language that is culturally neutral. It doesn't belong to any particular group. So, so these are the two major approaches, uh, conditional approach that was followed in Africa. The first is to build the nation in the image of the language, culture, and history of the dominant group or a particular group which could have sometimes could also be a minority group. Or in the other case, to build a nation based on non-ethnic premises. So here, you kill the, the tribe to build a nation. That is, you ignore diversity, you ignore ethnicity, and try to present an image of, 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 of a nation. Now, this was historically the two major approaches, conditional approach that was followed in Africa. And I think you can say more or less the same across the world. Now, have this succeeded? Have this conditional approach succeeded in, uh, in creating the image of this nation? Now, what is the, what is the empirical evidence whether this has succeeded or not. <coughs> Any idea whether this kind of approach has succeeded or not? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's, that's a, a very good because Tanzania stands out in Africa. Uh, probably at the only country, at the only country, where ethnicity is not an issue, where ethnic divisions do not characterize the political discourse, and 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 that's because they've tried, they've succeeded in building a nation where ethnicity is not a major dividing force. But what about in the rest of the continent? You're saying no. Oh. Mm. 
okay. to the problem. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty, pretty much the case in the sense that, that this attempt to build the nation hasn't really produced the desired result. It hasn't really brought about uh, the idea of, of a homogenized society. It hasn't brought about political stability. It hasn't also brought about economic development. Now, the question is why? Why did it fail? Now, you can understand why it fails in the first cases. When you try to impose a language and culture on a particular group, you're, you're bound to provoke a violent reaction. Hmm? People are not, would not be happy, and hence they would reject and try to assert their own identity. Now it makes sense. But why did it fail even in the second case? In the second approach, which is followed in most African countries. In, 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 a, in societies where the state did not try to impose a single identity based on the language culture of a particular group. Now, why did it fail in those cases? Yes. Okay. So they cannot associate with the kind of identity that the state was promoting. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, but we said the second approach, as opposed to the first approach, is an approach where the state did not try to impose. The people wanted to. Okay, can you explain more? Why? What do you mean by that? Like, okay. Anyone else? Yes? Okay. So it's not something that you can relate to. Okay. Yes? Okay. What do you mean by that? So the question is, how did the state, for example, in Nigeria, avoid it or, or failed to make ethnicity a non-issue? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. They were actually shy. Yeah. Okay, so what you're saying is that when the colonial powers departed, then those divisions uh, came up, because in the first place they were artificial. Uh, yes. But wouldn't the struggle against colonization has created some kind of identity? Wouldn't it? Just thinking. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, some of the, expan the explanations, I think, explain partly why the, uh, uh, the state failed or the conditional approach failed in bringing about uh, uh, the idea of a nation. But also because even if these states, many of these African states, even if their constitution has not imposed a single language and culture of a particular group over the rest of the population, at the end of the day, the state ended up identified with a particular group. And that is because successive leaders of these African states used state resources to advantage themselves and members of their own ethnic group. And because of that, access to state power was, was what we call ethnified. That ethnic-based ethnic mobilization became the basis to access, to capture the center to capture state power. And because of that, even if these states and the, their constitution have not imposed a single identity, it still ends up as a, being a society where ethnicity is a basis for political mobilization. So because of that, uh, Bo's approach, as I said, failed in bringing about uh, uh, or, or in making ethnic, uh, ethnicity a non-issue or, or ethnicity, ethnic diversity a less divisive uh, instrument, uh, in its, uh, basis for political mobilization. Now, so these are the early responses. So now, in the last two, three decades, we've seen the emergence of, of, of the federal solution. Federalism emerging as a solution to deal with the challenges of, of ethnic diversity. Now, so in your idea, when you talk about federalism, what comes to your mind? What is, if you, just a basic uh, understanding of federalism. So what is federalism about? What, are, what does it entail? Yes. Okay, but called division of power. Okay. Well, often federalism is explained as as what we call self-rule plus shared rule, autonomy, and union. So federalism, on the one hand, is about allowing territories and communities to manage their own affairs. It's about allowing them to have a say, or even a final say, on economic, social, and cultural affairs, matters that are relevant for them. So that is autonomy, that's allowing them self-rule. 
But federalism is also about shared rule. It's about union. It's also about bringing these units, territories into the national political process, ensuring that they have a place in the national table, that they have a say and influence in central legislative and policy formations. So that's why we say federalism is about self-rule plus shared rule. Now, so in Africa, the federal solution emerged, as I said, in the last two or three decades. But only two countries explicitly recognize themselves as federal. Only two countries explicitly describe themselves as federal. And these are Nigeria, which is the oldest federation in Africa, and Ethiopia. These are the only two countries that, whose constitution formally describe the state as federal. But of course, there are also other countries that have strong federal features that are arguably are also federal. But they do not describe themselves as, as federal. Now, for example, let's, let's do this exercise. So let's check if they, any of these two countries, Kenya and South Africa, for example, meet the federal uh, requirements. So tell me, for example, one characteristic of a federal uh, system, and I'll tell you whether South Africa or Kenya has it. So let's start. So what? Yes. Two orders of government. So there must be two orders of government, each order of government exercising some sort of jurisdiction over a particular matter, over a particular area. And that's the case in Kenya. Kenya has uh, the federal, the national government, and has what it calls counties. Counties, like you call them states. See? So counties, so there are about 47 of them. 47 counties, each county exercising a particular uh, area. And South Africa, the same. South Africa has a national government, and it has also provincial government, but also a local government. All of them acting independently of the other. All of them have entrenched powers from the, from the constitution. So they tick that box. Both Kenya and South Africa. What else? What is the other feature of a federal system? Federal source is the highest for the supremacy of, of, the, of the federal constitution. Yes. In both cases, the supreme law is the constitution. Okay. What else? What else? What are the other features of a federal system? Yes, independent court. So in any federal system, there must be an umpire, an umpire that, is, that settles disputes between the different levels of, of government. In South Africa, that is given to the constitutional court. In Kenya, the Supreme Court dis, uh, uh, adjudicates disputes between the different levels of government. What else? chamber. So federalism, in addition to you, autonomy, it's also about union, shared rule. And that is one way that is realized is through the representation of the units in the national parliament, and usually in the second chamber. And both in Kenya and South Africa, you have that. Kenya has a Senate. South Africa has what you call National Council of Provinces. So you can go on the list, and they tick all the boxes, but they do not consider themselves as federal. In fact, sometimes it's a taboo to discuss federalism or to regard the state as federal. Now, why is that? Why, why, why is the reluctance to regard themselves as federal while they all comply with the requirements of a federal arrangement? 
Now it has to do with history. With history. In, because in, in the early days, so for example in South Africa, during the making of the constitution in the 90s, there was a huge debate on what to call the state. Should we call it federal or not? And that was a strong debate and I was rejected. It was rejected because it was seen as a form of a grand apartheid. You know about apartheid. So apartheid divided people along race lines, yes? But what, what apartheid also did was that it also divided the black community in South Africa along ethnic lines and gave each of them a homeland. So federalism is seen as kind of the reintroduction of, of that area. So because of that, there is huge reluctance to regard the state as, as federal. But, but they have federal features. Now, I think you, you must have done this in terms of the minimum elements which we discussed. Now, let's talk about then briefly about autonomy in African uh, uh, federations. Now, I'm sure you've discussed this in, the, in, in, in your class, that there are different ways by which a constitution can give autonomy to a particular uh, territory or to a particular unit. So autonomy finds expression in the geographical configuration of the, of the state, in how the boundaries of the state are drawn, and also finds expression in the division of power between the different levels of government, that is, which powers are allocated to which level of government, and also in terms of the financial powers, the division between financial powers. So by looking at those three, you can tell whether there is autonomy or not, and the degree of the autonomy as well. Now we, can't, we don't have any, enough time to go through all this, but I will focus on what uh, the territorial structure of a federation and how that affects ethnic diversity. Now, when a country draws its internal boundaries, when it uh, draws its internal uh, territorial structure, uh, there are, broadly speaking, two options that it might wish to follow. Now, the first option is to draw the boundaries according to geographic or administrative convenience. So, here, you draw your boundaries, you, you divide them into different states or provinces, as you call them, or, or regions, and you use administrative and geographic convenience as a basis to do that. So the units are sometimes fixed with what you call ruler and compass. So no other factor is taken into account. Now, that is one way uh, to draw the boundaries. The other way in which a state can go about uh, creating these federated, federal units is is to, to take ethnicity as a basis for the organization of, of the state. So here, communal bonds are taken into account when you draw the boundaries. The first approach ignores communal bonds, doesn't take into account uh, ethnicity or any other diversity, but this approach takes ethnic diversity as the basis for the organization. So here, the approach is for to draw the boundaries along ethnic or linguistic or religious lines, as the case may be. So each area would accommodate a separate group, a separate group. Now, outside Africa, you have examples like, for example, India, uh, where you know, ethnicity is used as a basis uh, to organize. Uh, uh, the federation. Now, 
Can you think of examples in Europe which kind of shows these differences of approach? Yes. Belgium. So Belgium would be uh, falling in the second uh, group where boundaries are, I mean, the Belgium is a very complicated uh, federation because it also has regions, communities, and, 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 and different uh, uh, ex uh, explanations for that. But yes, one of the elements in Belgium is where the territories, the regions, are drawn along linguistic lines. So you have the Flemish region and you have the Wallon region. But many others are, do not take ethnic bonds into account. Now, maybe, yeah. Uh, so now we discuss in terms of the African federations, which approach has been followed uh, in, this, in, uh, in, in, the, in African countries. Uh, maybe I think we should just break. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we continue from where we left. Uh, so we were talking about uh, one way by which uh, a federal constitution uh, can give effect to territorial autonomy. Uh, and we said Broadly speaking, one way is for the constitution to uh, to to make the territorial the territorial structure based on non-ethnic factors. That is to take just geography or administrative convenience into account. And while the other approach is is, is to make or take ethnicity as a basis for the organization of of the state. Now, in Africa. Some of the states uh, have followed the second approach. And a very good example of that is, is Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia, like most African countries, uh, is very diverse linguistically, ethnically, religiously. So there are about uh, 80 ethnic groups. Uh, and, so, and almost about the same amount of uh, linguistic groups. Now, the constitution, uh, unlike many other constitutions, uh, which start with we the people of, for example, United States, the Ethiopian constitution begins with we, the nations, nationalities, and peoples of Ethiopia. So it doesn't start with the usual we the people. So already you can see here uh, that, that, that there is a clear uh, departure from a conditional approach that uh, tries to uh, uh, present an image of one people. And that also you see it in the territorial structure. So for the, the point of departure for autonomy, self-government in Ethiopia is not administrative convenience, it's not geographical convenience, but rather ethnicity. So Article 39 of the Constitution says that, that ethnic groups have the right to establish institutions of government in the territory they inhabit. So this is one of the first indications that the Constitution has opted to organize the Federation along ethnic lines. And a more straightforward, more explicit indication comes from Article 46 of the Constitution, which says that geographical configuration of the Federation shall be based on the basis of settlement patterns, language, identity, and consent of the people concerned. So here you see that, that, that that the, the constitution has opted ethnicity as the basis to organize the federation. Now, based on that, the 
if I can show you a map here. So here you can see uh, the federation, uh, the federal map of Ethiopia. Now, as I said, ethnicity is the basis for the organization, of the organization of the federation. So based on that, the condition has created nine states, nine states. Of the nine states, five of them at least are based or, or are drawn based on ethnic identity. So, so more than 85% of uh, the people that live, for example, in Oromia, Somali, Amhara, Tigray, or Afar, belong to the one ethnic group, belong to one ethnic group. So you, you also see that, that the constitution has named these states after the name of the dominant ethnic group. So for example, you have Oromia state. That is a state that is dominated by the Oromo people. You have the Afar state on the far side there. And that is a state that is dominated by the Afar people. So you see a very clear articulation, designation of, by the constitution of a particular territory belonging to a particular group. So it kind of creates a homeland for these major ethnic groups. Now, so this is, you can see that there is an explicit construction and designation of the states as belonging to particular ethnic groups. So this is a typical or a example of, of a federation that uses ethnicity as a basis to organize the state. Now the question is, is it a good federal response? Such kind of approach. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You are in, in, in a divided society, you want a constitution that would try to respond to the concerns, the challenges that occur the society faces. So one country, Ethiopia, and also other countries, uh, I think in Europe you can uh, take Belgium and others, who, who have to some extent opted to organize the federation along these lines. Now, what, 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 is it a good federal solution? Okay. So, so this, you think, uh, militates or works against national unity, that... <laughs> okay, a big... Uh, okay. saying that this is something that uh, adversely affects the social cohesion, the unity of, of the country. Okay? You're saying this? You agree? Why do you agree?
Dortmund das macht. Okay. Mostly, what he said is it can be neg negative, but it's not a good thing. Uh, that nothing positive yeah. out of this kind of arrangement. Uh, you mentioned something. Uh, okay, what's the positive? of minority groups, okay? Yes. The federal structure can allow uh, allows solving of problems in a flat way. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a safety of minorities within minorities mm -hmm. and a safe of uh, independence between large ethnic groups. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Pieces to allow them. Yes, I think uh, you've, you've uh, more or less captured uh, uh, the pros and cons of, of, of this arrangement. Yes, on the one hand, this kind of arrangement, what it does, is that it represents recognition of diversity. Uh, so, in the case of Ethiopia, for example, it departs from the successive regimes or the successive approaches that have tried to build the image of one nation based on the language and culture of one group. So here, in this approach, recognition of diversity is, is evident. It's evident. Uh, and there's also, what it does, it also gives each of these communities the space, the territory in which they can promote their language and culture. And this is facilitated by the fact that the constitution allows each state to determine its own language policy. So it promotes to the self-management of communities by uh, allowing them or giving them the space to uh, use their language and also promote their culture. It also allows for members of this, uh, individuals who are members of this group uh, to be able to be participate and represent, be represented in the leadership structure of of the state governments. So it gives the elites of these communities a means to access political uh, power. So there will be more offices to, to be occupied. So there will be more representations. So there are those uh, benefits. So it contributes, has the potential to contribute for the self-management of communities. But also it's not without problem which some of you have already mentioned. Now in the case of uh, Ethiopia, and also I think the, um, the case with this kind of approach that it kind of makes ethnicity or promotes ethnicity as a primary political identity. And that would result in the fragmentation of the population along ethno-linguistic 
lines. So for example, in the case of Ethiopia, you would see it in the different ways how ethnicity has been promoted to be a primary political identity. First, you see that it's increasingly used as a basis for political mobilization. So almost after the introduction of this system, almost every group felt the need to establish their own political parties. So of the, I think, 70 or so uh, political parties that you have in the country, more than two thirds are ethnic-based parties. So you see increasing use of ethnicity as a basis uh, for political mobilization. You also see that the increasing translation of, of cultural communities into political communities. So in the past, cultural I identities, which are only simply ethnic identities, have also now become political identities because every and each group now demands recognition as a distinct community. Every each, and each group now wants to have a territory in which it's a majority, in its own state or its own local government. And even communities that were regarded as one, as one unit, now are being separated because members of that particular group are claiming distinct identity. So you see an increasing translation of the ethnic identity into a political identity. So every uh, ethnic group now demanding some sort of recognition. But also the elevation of ethnicity into a primary political identity is evident in the fact that, that some communities are demanding to be transferred from one state to another state. Now why do they demand? Because they demand so because they feel that they do not belong to the community they have been demarcated into. So it's motivated by issues of identity and belongingness. And this is the consequence of the geographical configuration which has constructed some states as belonging to particular ethnic groups and leaves others with the feeling of an outsider, a guest. So, in as much as it has allowed communities to manage their own affairs, to promote their language and culture, it has also contributed to the fragmentation of the population along ethno-linguistic lines. So increasingly, as a result of the system that rewards, that rewards mobilization along ethnic lines, people are increasingly using ethnicity to access state power. So a federal arrangement that has promoted accommodated diversity has also undermined national unity. So how, how can you get out of this? How can a, a federation accommodate diversity without putting a strain on the national unity, without damaging the integration of the different communities into uh, one unit? Now, the other model which we're going to see is, is maybe is what the South Africa, uh, uh, sorry, the Nigeria and the Kenyan model. Now, uh, in Nigeria, okay, our colleague has left, or maybe she could have explained it more better than I do. Now, in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is one of the oldest federations in Africa. Now, Nigeria started as a three-unit federation, as a three-unit federation. So it has, it has only three uh, states. And each state was dominated by a particular ethnic group. Then you have the Hausa Fulani in the north, the Igbo in the east, and the Yoruba in the west. Now, each state is, of course, home to a diverse number of ethnic groups, but one group, each of these groups are dominant in each of the three states. Now, that wasn't, uh, that, that did not work. So 
a decision was made to increase the number of states. So initially, from three to four, then later to 12, later to 19, and today Nigeria is, has 36 states, 36 states. Now, as in, in, in increasing the number of states, the approach that has been followed by Nigeria is first to give states to some minority groups, but also to divide the large ethnic groups into a number of states. So as opposed to the big one ethnic group having one state, then that ethnic group is divided into a number of states. So the Yoruba used to be one state or in, the, in the southwest. Now they are dominant in, divided into six or five states, the same with the others. So, so what it averts is that, unlike Ethiopia, it does not identify one ethnic group with one particular territory. The Kenyan approach is more or less the same. Kenya adopted its new constitution in 2010. It has 47 counties. Now, these counties were uh, based on what we call the colonial districts. Uh, so these were districts that were established by the colonial power, uh, Great Britain. So it's the same uh, map that is used for the new uh, Kenya. And the issue is that these districts are ethnic-based. They are ethnic-based. But again, it does not identify one ethnic group or the large ethnic group with one county. The large ethnic groups are divided into a number of counties. For example, the largest ethnic group, one of the largest is the Kikuyu. The, and they would be divided into a number of counties, four or, or five. Now, so more, the two are more or less following the same approach. Now, what do you think of this approach? Does it address the concerns that we mentioned earlier? Or is it uh, no, no difference from the previous one. Can it produce a different result in terms of accommodation of diversity and integration? Or is it the same? So one of the crucial elements of this is the division of the large ethnic groups into a number of states as opposed to one state. Why, how would that help? Okay, Prof. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it makes it more accessible to. It makes the administration, the administration more accessible to the people. Okay. Yes, that's true. Yes. Do you mean in, in terms of what uh, Prof said, in terms of the creation of, uh, of divisions within one ethnic group? <laughs> okay. You think that's, a, that, that, that's more a challenge than, than having them as one unit? Which one? Is, 
could be. Okay. To govern, okay. Of course, the, I mean, federalism is a very expensive uh, arrangement because you have to create more offices, which means that you have to have more professionals occupying those offices, which means you have to pay for more people. So, in that sense, yes, uh, the more you fragment, the more you create new states, the more you create new positions, that makes it more expensive. Well, I think. In terms of our topic, in terms of how uh, ethnic diversity and uh, accumulation of diversity, what this system uh, helps to do is it creates, uh, I'm going to focus on the second one, it creates an incentive for inter ethnic, well, sorry, intra ethnic competition. Now, let me explain this. So, in the first category, in the Ethiopian kind of model, what we see is a competition between two different states which belong to two different ethnic groups. So the competition between the states is the same as competition between ethnic groups. But here, what you have is that not necessarily competition between the states that belong to two different ethnic groups, but you will have a competition between the states that belong to the same ethnic groups. So you would have intra-ethnic competition. Now, why is that a good thing? Why is that a good thing? First, as has been said, it's a good thing because it downgrades the status of ethnicity as a primary and only basis for political mobilization. You will see the emergence of sub-ethnic identities, the emergence of other identities, that people are not necessarily only identified by their ethnic identity, but also other identities might uh, emerge. And, and that, is, that, is good because, that is good because intra ethnic divisions are more manageable than inter ethnic divisions. Because in inter ethnic divisions are more emotionally charged and, and pose a threat to the to the territorial integrity of, of the state. They pose a danger to the stability of, of the state. But if it's intra, if it's local conflicts, it would be less threatening to the state. But also, the fragmentation means, means that, that you don't anymore have those large ethnic groups identified with one particular state, which feels itself as almost as an state, as independent state that can go on its own and establish uh, its own sovereign and independent state. So in that sense, it also lessens the secessionist threat that might come from a large ethnic group, because that large ethnic group is no longer now associated with one big state, but rather divided into a number of states. So Nigeria, for example, in the, 67, in the 1967, it had what you call the Biafra War. Have you ever heard of that? So that's the Biafra War is one of the most devastating wars that happened in Africa in the 1967. That's, it happened when the Igbo, the uh, eastern part of Nigeria, wanted to secede from, leave Nigeria and establish their own state. It was one big state. Of course, within Igbo, within that state, there are different ethnic groups but they want to establish their own independent state. But you no longer have now that one ethnic group identified with one particular state. It's divided into a number of states. And because of that, Nigeria now does not face a secessionist agenda. Now let me explain this uh, slowly. Uh, so now what you have is an ethnic group that is no longer identified with one state. You have an ethnic group that is divided into a number of states. So the hope of such an arrangement, the promise of such a system, is that this group is no longer in a position to threaten the stability of of the state. It's not in a position 
to demand cessation because it's smaller, it's divided, it doesn't necessarily have the resources it might need or doesn't feel big enough to leave the federation. So by uh, creating this, by dividing a, a, a big group into a number of states, you avoid uh, uh, a situation where the territorial integrity of the state might be in danger. Is that clear? Okay, any questions on this before we uh, move to the, I think we have got a, almost half, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Any questions? Now let's briefly talk about, very quickly, talk about the shared rule aspect. We said federalism is not, is not only about self-rule, it's also about sorry, shared rule. Now, first of all, why is shared rule important? Why isn't, why isn't it enough to have self-rule? Hmm? Why? If ethnic groups want to uh, be accommodated, why isn't it enough to give them autonomy to administer themselves. Why do we also have to bother about shared rule? Yes? Unity, yes. So it's one way by which you can create national unity. It's a means to deal with shared objectives. Yes? Okay. Well, you might have dual federal systems, but of course, I think the point is that, 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 that if you emphasize self-rule autonomy, then you might actually pose a threat to the uh, unity of the, of, of, of the country. So those are the two reasons. Now, shared rule, when, how is it realized? How is it given effect to? It's about representation in national institutions. And one way to do that is through a bicameral parliament. And often that is, happens through the second chamber. Now, the capacity of a second chamber to be an, uh, a forum where subnational units would be effectively represented, first, it depends on two things. First, it depends on the composition and the manner in which members are elected to the Senate or the second chamber, but also on the power that the Senate exercises. So these are the two factors that one can look at and determine whether uh, a system, or whether the system allows for an effective and adequate representation of subnational interests. Now, let's very quickly look at some of uh, the second chambers in Africa, Nigeria. Nigeria has a bicameral parliament, includes a senate. Uh, the senate has about 109 members, and each of the state is represented equally in the senate. Each state has three representatives. And the, senates, the senators are elected directly by the people. And the senate enjoys uh, huge influence in the legislative process. So any law, uh, in order, any bill, in order to become a law, must secure the blessing of both houses. It must also be uh, approved by the Senate. So the Senate has a very strong power. If a bill is not accepted by the Senate, then it doesn't become a bill. Now, so briefly from this, is this a Senate that is in a position to ensure the representation of, of subnational interests? So if we say we have to look at the composition, we have to look at the powers that it enjoys. Now based on that, would you say this is a Senate that is in a position to represent subnational interests? Why? Hmm? 
Yes, why? You said why? If you look at the okay, if you look at the powers, it has strong powers, yes, because the lower house cannot override the Senate. Any bill must accept, must get the approval of the Senate to become a law. So, in terms of power, yes, it has the powers, but the question is, does it have the link with the subnational units? Are the senators in a position to advance the interests of the subnational units? Are they encouraged to do so? Now they are elected directly by the by the people. So which means that they are not bound to represent any subnational interest. What they are bound is to represent their constituency. So members of the Senate here are almost act like national politicians not as a politician that represents subnational interests, because they are not bound uh, uh, to advance the interests of the subnational units. What they are bound because of election is to advance the interests of their constituent uh, units, the, sorry, the districts from which they come from. Now let's look at, and I think this becomes clearer as we look at the, the other examples, Kenya. Kenya has, his Kenya has 67 members. Uh, the members are directly elected. Each county, we have, we've said there are 47 counties, each county is represented by one member. Now, in terms of powers, the Senate in Kenya does not participate in all kinds of legislation. In Nigeria, we say the Senate has equal power with the lower house, yes? But in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, the Senate can only participate in laws that affect county government, in laws that affect the subnational government. With regard to those, uh, 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 those legislations, it has co-equal power. In other words, a bill will not become a law unless it secures the blessing of the Senate, if it's a bill that concerns county government. But in, our own, in all other cases, the Senate cannot participate, cannot participate. It also requires the senators from the same county to vote only one vote. So there might be more than one person from one county. Of course, one, each, let me explain this, each county is represented by one member, that's 47 members then, but the Senate has additional 20 members, 20 members. And those 20 members represent uh, women, persons with disabilities, and the young. But of course they would come from a different counties, or they might be associated with different counties. So you might have a situation where there will be more than one senator from, from one county. In those cases, the requirement is that, of the condition is that, they must cast a single vote. They must consult each other and cast one vote. So they, are, they do not vote individually. They, they vote as a county. Huh? Yes, exactly. So they are for 67 members, but 47 votes. Now, what do you think of this approach? Hmm? Back benches are very quiet, so from the back, anyone? Okay. Yes, so. What do you think in terms of the 
representation of subnational interest. Is this a good system? If you look at the composition of the Senate, and if you look at the power it exercises, so we said we have to look at the composition of the Senate, and we have to look at the power it exercises to determine whether this is a, a house that represents adequately subnational interest. Okay, yes, you said, and then. Yes. So what you're saying is, yeah, yeah, so what you're saying that irrespective of their population size, they are equally represented, which is, you think it's a good thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. But also, do you think that the, the system puts the senators in a position that they can effectively advance the interests of the county, the interests of the subnational unit? Well, I think what, uh, what makes it, in, in terms of its power and function, it's clear that it's in a position to advance subnational interests because we say that if a law concerns a county government and it may secure the blessing of, of the Senate, so it has the powers to do that. But the question is, does the senators have a, a direct link with the counties? And here again, they are directly elected, which means that, that they are not... Uh, bound or instructed to vote based on the instructions of the county government. But what makes it different from Nigeria is that, that there is a requirement that they must consult and vote as a county. Now that somehow might put them in a position or force them to advance county interests. But there is no guarantee because if the people belong to the same political party, they might vote along party lines as opposed to uh, uh, county interest. But at least from, compared to the Nigeria, this uh, gives them, puts them in a better position to advance county interest. But a more interesting example would be South Africa. Now in South Africa, and what you have is a national council of provinces. Now each province is represented by a, uh, by 10 people. So there's equal representation of the provinces. Now, they are not directly elected. They are actually drawn from members of the provincial legislature and the provincial executive. So that makes it different from the Kenyan and the Nigeria. So you have members of the provincial government sitting in the Senate representing a province or members of the provincial legislature. So about 10 of them. And each delegation must also reflect the parties that are represented in the province. So it cannot be just composed of one party. Now in terms of powers, the NCOP can participate in both kind of bills, in bills that affect provinces, but also bills that do not affect provinces. So it's like, like the Nigerian one, unlike the Kenyan. But here, it enjoys more power with regard to bills that affect provinces. If a bill affects provinces, it must secure the blessing of the NCOP. If the two houses cannot agree, then it, it is sent to what is called a mediation committee, 
a committee that is composed of equal number of people from both houses. And they must try to come up with a bill that's acceptable by both houses. If they fail to do that, then the lower house can pass the bill, but only if, secures, if it secures two-thirds support from the members of the National Assembly. Now, what do you think of this? Does this put the NCOP, the second chamber, in a position to advance subnational interests better than the other, or is it the same? What's the difference here? One thing I didn't mention is that, which, which I think makes a difference, is that when they vote, when these members of the Senate vote, if a bill affects the provinces, then they vote a single vote, like the Kenyans. And they vote based on the instruction they receive from the provincial government. So, is it, what do you think? Is this better positioned than the others, or is it the same? What's the major difference between the South African approach and the other approach? What is the major difference that you, you can identify? Hmm? Yes? So what we see is a direct link between the subnational into the province and those sitting in the Senate. Because these are people that are elect that, that are not directly elected, that are actually appointed by the provincial legislature and executive to sit in the Senate representing the interests of the provinces. But more importantly, they do not enjoy individual vote. When it when a bill affects provinces, the, the 10 people that represent the provinces are regarded as one unit, as a single delegation that must cast a single vote. And that vote is, uh, it, it must be done based on the instructions of the provincial government. So they don't have independent vote. They vote based on instruction they receive from the province. So they have to consult their provincial government, and the provincial government will tell them how to vote, and then they vote based on that instruction. So I think both in terms of its powers and function, but also in terms of the link between the Senate and the provinces, the NCOP, the South African Second Chamber, seems to be in a better position to advance subnational uh, interests. Uh, I think it's almost time. By contrast, in the Senate, we have a representation of the states, but there are direct elections. So you may end up in a situation in which the, the government in the federate unit is, let's say, red, but the directed uh, the, the representatives, the senators, are blue. And there is this junction that is quite difficult for the blue senators to take up so, for example, uh, the difference is in the case of Nigeria and Kenya, you might uh, have a senators that will vote against the interests of county government because the county government belongs to a different political party. So, but in, the, in this case, that's not possible in the South African case because you, in, you vote based on the instruction you receive from the provincial 
government. You do not have independent vote. You vote based on inst instructions. That, so that kind of strengthens the link between the Senate and uh, uh, the subnationalists. Okay, so I think it's time, and that's all from me. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I would like really to, uh, to thank Professor Fessa for his lecture. I hope the slides will be available because uh, this is something maybe we can use also if you have other questions. We'll come back on this distinction between Senate and Council when we'll discuss the model countries of uh, Germany and uh, uh, the United States of America. Tomorrow we don't have class. I'll see you on Thursday. Okay?